My name's David Eastwood. I've been making paintings and drawings informed by artist studios for a little while now, particularly most recently looking at the studio of Giorgio Morandi, the 20th century Italian still life painter. And uh, that's informed a show that I've curated for Robin Gibson Gallery called Speculative Spaces, which includes nine artists, all of whom work with some kind of miniature model or set or tabletop sculpture or diorama, which is used as uh, a kind of uh, springboard for, for paintings or drawings or photographs or videos. I'm interested in the studio as a space where a degree of invention takes place. Uh, I've constructed a model which is a 1 15th replica of his studio in order to use it as a tool to develop images from uh, in painting and, and drawing mostly. Um, I've never visited Mirandi's studio. It's been reconstructed in the, its original location in Bologna. Uh, but I'm interested in the idea of fabricating it from a distance based on photographs and things I've read and filling in my gaps in knowledge with invention and imagination. But it's as accurate as I've been able to make it based on the evidence at hand that I've gleaned from the internet and books and so forth. How did you start looking at the uh, artist studio? Uh, in 2008 I was on a residency in Paris and before I arrived I was travelling around uh, various places in Europe including Dublin where I saw Francis Bacon's reconstructed studio in the Hugh Lane Gallery and that sparked my interest. At the time I was very interested in uh, historical ornate interiors from Europe and that's why I was going to Paris and uh, I saw Bacon's studio and it struck me as another um, museum uh, preserved space but not the, the kind of resplendent um, aristocratic interior. It was this hovel, this absolute mess, uh, but presented in such a way, you know, preserved as uh, an authentic specimen of how artists live or how this particular artist lived. Uh, which at the same time was a, an artifice and uh, so I was interested in that tension between truth and fiction that these museum interiors represented with uh, and now I'm, I'm engaged in that subject with specific regard to posthumously reconstructed artist studios of which Mirandi's is another. Mirandi is often described as the painter's painter um, I arrived at Mirandi after having looked at Bacon's studio quite closely and I think it was the comparison between the two studios that, that struck me as, as interesting. Bacon's studio uh, has this sense of claustrophobia where the objects are piled up, there's barely a spot to stand. Bacon could never see his triptychs sitting side by side in his studio. He had to wait till he got them to a, a gallery, supposedly, to be able to view them as they were intended. So there's this sort of oppressive character to Bacon's studio. And Mirandi's studio was a, a, a contrast to that. It was more ordered and um, the biography and, and, and the, the sort of mythology of Mirandi is that he was quite reclusive and monastic in the way he approached his work and the space of his studio reflects that myth. Uh, he has this single bed in the studio with a white sheet so it's very 
virginal and monastic and um, the, uh, the, the fact that he painted these still life objects which are all on display on shelves around the room speaks of this very insular existence uh, which is kind of agoraphobic in a way you know if someone never leaves the house and, and you know spends most of their life looking at objects in the interior um, it you know it's it's another side to some kind of um, psychological anxiety over uh, the the space of the interior so you know on the one hand there's the claustrophobia of Bacon studio and then you've got the agoraphobia of Mirandi. Should we talk a little bit about the artifice? Yeah I've been um, interested in the way that museums frame objects and spaces as um, authentic artifacts but in doing so in presenting something to the public there's there's a kind of um, sterilization that that comes with the way things are packaged for, for an audience um, and uh, Mirandi's studio for example has been dismantled and relocated a couple of times uh, it's now in its original location but the building's been renovated and a corner has been chopped out to create uh, a viewing position for, for um, visitors to peer through glass to look at the studio. My model uh, is based on how the space was when Mirandi was alive but also is informed by images of the, the studio as it is presented now. So it has, it, it carries with it that sense of theatre or artifice, you know, so there's a, there's a plausibility or an authenticity uh, presented to the, the visitor, which I'm also calling into question and, and um, you know, because there's a, the, the fact that it's contextualised as a museum specimen uh, elevates this this room to mythological status or you know it's it's eulogizing Mirandi but also the the practice of painting and and the space of the studio as some kind of magical place where you can find the or witness the, the aura of of Mirandi and hopefully like glean a bit of his genius from this stuff or something yeah, as though the, these objects carry some kind of DNA of, of Mirandi. I am interested in the peripheral and ambient space of Mirandi's paintings, which is what the studio is, um, but not as a way to um, capture the 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 aura or, or mythologize, further mythologize the artist. Um, just as a, a kind of investigation of the broader context and, and speculating about um, the, the psychology of, of the space of Mirandi. Mirandi, of course, the thing about his paintings is that he was painting very ordinary everyday objects and it was the act of painting them and his particular way of painting which transcended the banality of the objects. Um, but now the objects themselves are presented as some kind of um, conduit for, for Mirandi's genius. So, and they do kind of carry um, all the all the connotations of, of um, Mirandi's oeuvre, but um, that's because they're now familiar through Mirandi's paintings. So when you look at the space of Mirandi's studio, you're, you're looking at them through a, a prism. If you're aware of Mirandi's paintings, it makes the space of the studio somehow 
more interesting or, or magical. You know, oh, that's the thing he was looking at when he made that painting. And um, so um, I'm interested in that, um, those connections between the image and the object. And so I'm, when I'm carving his objects in miniature versions, I'm as much looking at his paintings as I am his objects. And shrunken down on a miniature scale, there's a wonkiness. You know, the, the objects aren't perfectly crafted and they take on more of the character of the trembling lines and forms of Mirandi's paintings. There's a beautiful um, book about a guy who creates miniatures and he keeps on making smaller and smaller things. It at once makes you the master of the universe because you're obviously much bigger than it. Mm. But it makes you feel quite childish or something, quite quite young. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, it becomes a dollhouse, this thing. But it's, um, Susan Stewart has written a, about the, the miniature in her book On Longing. Um, and she writes of the dollhouse as having this kind of insularity. It's the, you know, the, the interior of the, this miniature is a within, within, within. You know, it's, it's an interior inside another interior. And it has this kind of, um, it's, it's a distinct space which we can't enter because of the, the scale of the miniature. But it's also uh, very intimate and seductive and we peer into it like peering through a keyhole. Um, so it, it's this sort of double um, sensation of being excluded but also being drawn in.